get this going. All right, welcome everyone to African American Film History. My name is VJ, and I went to school for film, and I've been doing a lot of study of film history in very in, in a lot of different contexts for a lot of different years. I love film. Film has always been my passion, and I find it to be one of the most influential mediums of them all. Primarily because film as an art form is a collection of every other art form put together. You know, if you want to talk about fine art, you want to talk about storytelling, you want to talk about music, it all comes together in film. So it pretty much is the universal art in so many ways. And I think that actually explains why it's had such a profound impact on so many things. I wanted to do this class because of the events that are going on right now, which I know everyone has so many strong feelings about and so much is going on. And I wanted to go back and look at the historical context that maybe have created, cultivated, and fought against the environment in which we currently live. This is not, these are not issues that we can understand simply by looking at George Floyd or even just by looking at the news. We have to take a look at it from so many different perspectives and so much history, and it's such a profoundly disturbing topic in some ways, but also inspiring if you look at film history and see how people have been moving the needle forward through their portrayals, their storytelling, and all of these aspects. Um, if you have questions or thoughts, please save them until we get to. Uh, the discussion portion of this, and I promise you we'll have a healthy discussion moving forward. I want to begin this class, not at the beginning of film history, but actually with Sidney Poitier, right? And the reason I want to begin there is there was an incident in film history that was known by critics as the slap heard around the world. And the slap heard around the world happened in the movie In the Heat of the Night in 1957. Has anyone seen In the Heat of the Night? Okay, so In the Heat of the Night, I'm going to play a scene from that, and we're going to, uh, and you'll all have an opportunity to hear this, uh, to hear and see the slap heard around the world. So one second. Uh, yeah. Sorry, the first one will take me a moment and then my notes will be in order. Okay, so here I go sharing it. Make sure the share sound is on. Yep. Okay. I'm to think about what's important to me. I'm choosing more thoughtfully these days. Have you? Why'd you two come here? To ask you about Mr. Colbert. Let me understand this. You two came here to question me. Well, your, your attitudes, Mr. Endicott, your point of view are a matter of record. Some people, well, let us say the people who work for Mr. Colbert might reasonably regard you as the person least likely to mourn his passing. We were just trying to clarify some of the evidence. Was Mr. Colbert ever in this greenhouse, say last night about midnight? All right. That's where we're starting. This was known as the slap heard around the world because this had never been done before. Think about that. This had never been done before, where a black man had slapped a white man, especially one without getting punished for it. If it had happened before this in, in film history, it was done with the black person then punished for misbehavior. This was the first time that a black cop 
struck a white witness who slapped him first, right? Let's not forget that, but it slapped him first, but it was seen as the right thing to do and the good thing to do. This was a shot across the bow for a lot of things. It, I, it was a demarcation point. Pretty much you can split African-American film history into everything before this and everything after this, right? And we're gonna talk about why this moment was so profound. But this is the moment that the first half of this lecture is leading up to. And the funny thing is looking at it from 2020 eyes, it doesn't seem like that big a deal, right? The title of the movie was In the Heat of the Night. Some of you may know this as the movie in which Sidney Poitier, somebody calls him boy, and he responds with, you call me Mr. Tibbs, right? This was then parodied in The Lion King, where somebody calls Pumbaa a pig, and he says, you call me Mr. Pig, right? Um, so, but this is the movie where that comes from, In the Heat of the Night in 1957. So, let's go back. Let's, we need to understand why this is such a profound moment in African-American film history. African-American film history, the first half of it especially, really comes down to one thing, and that is the threat of the black male, okay? And the reason it begins here is because of a man named D.W. Griffith. Now, this is a very popular thing. A lot of people know about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But the first epic film in all of American film history was called Birth of a Nation. Everyone's heard of Birth of a Nation? Birth of a Nation was a three hour long silent film directed by, I want to call him the Steven Spielberg of his day. In Birth of a Nation, the close up was invented. The montage of battle sequences was invented. How a battle sequence was shot was invented, right? The epic was invented. How you define an epic film was invented. And all of this happened in The Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation's original title was The Klansman. And the reason it was called The Klansman in its original form was the movie was split into three parts. Two of them were historical, the assassination of Lincoln by John Wilkes Booth and the Civil War. The two out of three parts of the movie were completely historical, which made people who are watching it go, this is a factual movie, right? The third part was about a bunch of recently freed black slaves threatening to rape white women who are daughters of plantation owners. And in order to defend their honor, a group of heroes put hoods over their heads and formed the Ku Klux Klan. The birth of the Ku Klux Klan is the heroic and triumphant climax of the first epic film ever made. Okay, I'd like to show all of you the, let me go here. I wanna show all of you the poster for Birth of a Nation. Uh, you can you can actually watch the film online. It is still known as one of the most influential and popular uh, films in all of history. So as this opens up, let me pull this up. Go. So this is the poster here for Birth of a Nation. Right, D.W. Griffith's American Institution, The Birth of a Nation, the supreme picture of all time. And then you got the guy in the hood riding the horse, right? This is how film history started with the threat of the black male over the white women and the white men who had to defend the white women from the black male. That was the first iconic film, right? It was considered the greatest film of all time for decades. Okay. So that's the context. That's where we begin. All right, so if that's where film history begins, now I want to go back even farther and I want to speak about two entities. Uh, the first of these is little actualities. Does anyone know what an actuality is? When movies were first created in the 1900s, invented by Thomas Edison, actually, the first projector and uh, movie camera, was invented by Thomas Edison using technology created by Edward R. Murrow. The first, uh, Thomas Edison teamed up with a director named Edwin S. Porter. 
And one of the, and they made a lot of little like comedy films, minute long, less than a minute long, you know, a little bit more than a minute long. Those were the first movies, right? This is before movies had any length. Shooting a one minute long movie was a big deal. So I'm going to show you all a, uh, one of Thomas Edison and Edwin S. Porter's first, uh, first movies here. second did i freeze am i still on with everyone all right sorry my internet just for a second went weird there all right if i didn't freeze here for some reason my browser so i'll show you all of this this clip from the thomas edison edwin and wooden porter movie in a second as soon as this uh resolving host issue clears up but while that's happening the other thing i want to talk about is the history of the minstrel show and this predates film, right? So let's talk about, does anybody know what a minstrel show is? No? Uh, DJ? Okay. Yes. It's a, it's a racist depiction, right? A racial character, like say in blackface or... You know, That's what we call it now, okay. right? We have to go back and understand the history of the minstrel show to really understand where this began. So, Civil War ends, there are freed slaves, and all of a sudden, Black people and white people have to live together. And Black people are wanting to become entertainers, right? Wanting, their, wanting to become entertainers. So Blacks, African Americans, recently freed slaves, started the minstrel show. The minstrel show was a way of showing their singing, their dancing, their stories, so African Americans could share those stories with white and black audiences. This became very popular, right? Tap dancing, a little bit of song and dance, jokes, all this kind of stuff, right? And a lot of the jokes were very racial. Yeah, we are different than you white people. We blacks are different. It started as a very self-aware, stereotypical depiction of black people, almost as satire, because they knew that's what white people wanted to see. This was then taken over by white performers who also would wear blackface and perform minstrel shows as black people. Those shows lost the satirical edge, lost the this is comedy edge and became more, yeah, black people are lazy. Black people are stupid. Isn't it funny that this slave is really, you know, dumb? For those of you think, that think that this might have ended soon after the Civil War, remember that in the 50s, Walt Disney made a movie called Song of the House the South about a happy black man on the plantation going off to work whistling to bluebirds, right? That's how long the effects of the stereotypes created by the minstrel show lasted into the future. But the thing that I want to say about the minstrel show was when black people originally created it, it had a very strong structure. And the reason it had a very strong structure was actually a civil rights reason. We think of the minstrel show now as racist, stereotypical depictions of Black people. But the African Americans that first performed in these minstrel shows did so deliberately in an effort to move towards civil rights. Now, what do I mean by that? Each minstrel show is broken into three parts. In the first part, that would be the most stereotypical part. The African American actor would come out. They would be made fun of, they'd be a buffoon, they'd be lazy, they'd be stupid, whatever it was. And they would be the butt of the joke. They, but they'd also be singing and dancing and entertaining and very you know, talented, very physical. The second part of the minstrel show would be more based on puns and wordplay. And in fact, in many of this part, the point was that the jokes were actually really smart. The characters that you got introduced to as buffoons, you would suddenly see a different side of them where they were more intelligent, more intellectual, not intellectual, but wordplay, right? They might not even, the characters in the minstrel show might not even understand the joke, but the audience would. And of course the actors were the ones writing the material and making those wordplay jokes. And then the third part would be a satire of plantation life. 
And what that is, is a satire of slavery. The third part of the show, it would be misunderstandings between the massa and the slave. Differences between the field slave and the house slave. All of these kinds of things would become fodder for the closing climactic joke. Now, why was it structured this way? And this is very interesting and very, uh, this is very interesting and very interesting to note is that the character that started off as the buffoon, then we saw another side of them and we liked them. And in the third side, the white audiences would be experiencing slavery from the point of view of the black characters as a satire of plantation life. Does that make sense? In a very strategic three-part way, the minstrels were making white people identify with black people. Yeah, we're the buffoon, we're safe, come on in, water's fine. And then all of a sudden, now you're thinking like us. Now you're understanding us. Now you're seeing our viewpoint of plantation life. Yes? Everyone's following along? Okay, let me see if, uh, so we cut ahead to 1903. Why is this not working? Hold on, I'm going to, oh. I think I figured out why it's not working. Okay. Uh, give me one second. I'm sorry. Uh, I must have saved the wrong URL here. Okay, I don't need to worry about. And you can see, uh, you will see that when I share this video, Thomas Edison's name is proudly on this uh, very short film. It's a minute and two seconds long. It is silent. White man has a crush on a white woman in a train while the black slave sits by and is amused by their flirtation and their antics. Okay, that's it. That, folks, is the first interracial kiss in film history. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk through that. Uh, first off, by the way, Edwin S. Porter thought of himself as a progressive revolutionary because at least he was showing a black woman and a white woman sitting next to each other on a train in the same compartment. This was seen as progressive and liberal, not as backwards. Edwin S. Porter wasn't trying to make fun of black people in his eyes, right? When he directed this, in his eyes. And yet what you could see is at the end, the white guy is so disgusted by the fact that he kissed a black woman on the cheek that he has to spit into a newspaper, right? That's 1903, right? So just trying to give a little bit of context where this begins. Also, just so you all know, interracial couples, interracial relationships, which was commonly known back then as miscegenation, right? That was straight up against the law, right? To actually have whites and blacks in romantic liaisons, that was against the law. And it was very frequently what black men were getting lynched for. 60% of lynchings happened because a black man looked at a white woman the wrong way. So we're going to come back to this uh, interracial aspect frequently throughout all this, right? So now let's move on to, uh, now and then we had Birth of a Nation, which was in 1915. Oh, by the way, the thing about Birth of a Nation that I also wanna point out is that the movie was a huge success, biggest blockbuster. 
that anybody had seen. Nobody had seen anything love, like it. They loved Birth of a Nation, except for one group of people. And those were largely African-Americans. The NAACP was a fledgling organization at the time. For those of you that don't know, the NAACP is the premier black rights organization in the US. The NAACP, which had just been started, didn't like a birth of a nation. And so they picketed outside of the theaters a couple of times when Birth of a Nation was shown. A lot of Black people were critics of Birth of a Nation, originally titled The Klansman. This made D.W. Griffith feel so persecuted because people that weren't understanding him that his next movie was called Intolerance. And it was all about how people were intolerant to other people. And he told everyone, it's like, just the way that people are intolerant of me, I made a movie in which you can see how people are intolerant toward Jesus too. He literally made a movie comparing himself to Jesus because people said that his movie was racist when he made a movie about the start of the Ku Klux Klan. All right, he became the persecuted party in the story. So I don't wanna be under the impression that Birth of a Nation was created and there was, there was a little backlash, but it didn't make, black people were not seen as the victims of this film ever in, for the first three decades. D.W. Griffith was seen as the victim of this film because his genius was just not being acknowledged by these troublesome blacks who couldn't understand why the Ku Klux Klan was so great, right? So that's, that's where we begin. We have intolerance, all of this kind of stuff. Um, I want to move on to Lincoln Perry. Has anyone ever heard of Step and Fetch It? No? Step yes, I have. Uh, so we've had one person. Step and Fetch It. So Step and Fetch It was a character created by a Black actor named Lincoln Perry. And Step and Fetch It was the laziest man in the world, right? In fact, the running joke was... Step and Fetch It was the laziest servant in the world, right? Uh, the laziest servant in the world. And it was never quite made clear whether Step and Fetch It was a slave or a servant in the, early, in the earliest Step and Fetch It movies. All it was clear was he was lazy and tried to get out of work. This is a legitimate Black actor named Lincoln Perry who acted as Step and Fetch It and created this character. Right now we look back and we think of Step and Fetch It as gross. How could any black actor have done that? But I wanna point out a few things. How did a minstrel show begin in the first act? Right, and these are the traditions that Lincoln Perry came from. What we are talking about is the strategic implementation. Birth of a Nation made black people realize how marginalized they would be by the rest of the country. After slavery ended, they came off the, off the plantations going, the North is going to be different. And it wasn't. And they went, how do we change this? And the tradition that they had, that they created in order to strategically defeat this was the minstrel show. Lincoln Perry is still seen, despite having created Step and Fetch It, as a civil rights activist. It's crazy, right? He created one of the most stereotypical characters possible. And he's seen historically as a civil rights activist. And he was. He was super smart. He wrote articles. And he played a lazy buffoon. It was the character that he happened to play because it was act one of the minstrel show. Right? Lincoln Perry is also, I, wanna, I want to uh, tell everyone, the first Black actor to have a featured screen credit. He's the first Black actor to have his name on screen in the credits. Another little known fact about Lincoln Perry, he's the first black actor to ever make a million dollars. Right, first black actor to ever make a million dollars. So when we talk about Step and Fetch, it's really easy to be like, looking back on it going like, oh, that was horrible what Lincoln Perry did. But none of this stuff is easy and none of this stuff is without complexity, right? Everything has to be seen, white or black behavior from that time within a certain context, right? So uh, I can, one of, uh, what else did I wanna say about Lincoln Perry? Uh, oh, in 1940, after decades of acting, he quit acting for a while because 
they were never going to pay him as much as the white people next to him. And they were never going to give him credit above a white person. So he quit. He, it, this very popular. So this is not a guy who's insensitive to racial issues. He didn't create Step and Fetch It as like, oh, I just want to make money. Right? He's a guy very aware of racial issues, yet creating this character. Right? Um, and uh, the other thing about him, and this is a common a common theme that you're gonna hear coming up today, which is an interesting theme that I wanna talk about, is that he wasn't born in the US. Lincoln Perry was born in the Bahamas, right? And then immigrated to the US when he was very young. We're gonna come back to that and talk about why that may or may not be important in a little bit. Um, I can play, if you guys would like to see a Step and Fetch It skit, I can play it for you all. What is this F word that turns a woman on and makes her start to chase you? Here we go. No, it's not that. So that's about how he's due at a uh, at a performance, and he can't get out of bed, right? And that, and he just doesn't want to get out of bed, right? And he's playing Lazy Richard. Now, two last things I want to say about Step and Fetch It is the movie that clip that I just showed you. You know what the name of that movie is? Open the door, Richard, because the entire thing is about getting him up out of bed and getting him to open the door and head out the door, right? But that was a deliberate thing. Somebody asked Lincoln Perry years later in the 60s, right? Are you aware of the damage that you did to the black cause? And he said, no, I'm aware of the help that I did for the black cause. And I knew what it was because I named the movie Open the Door Richard, right? He knew what he was doing was his claim that it was act one of the minstrel show. Right. The other thing that I want to say about uh, Step and Fetch It is uh, after 1940, after he quit for a while going, they're never going to treat me equally, no matter what I do. When he came back, he came back with the Step and Fetch It character, but with a different twist on the Step and Fetch It character. And in this twist, Step and Fetch It had never been lazy. Step and Fetch It just didn't want to work to make money for others through his labors and had been pretending to be lazy and had been resourcefully avoiding providing labor to others on his own back for so many years. There was a twist to the character when the character returned. There was a subtext to the character so that nobody could ever look at Step and Fetch it again and go like, oh, black people are just lazy. No, no, he just outsmarted me. That was the story after 1940. Intolerance said, I'm sorry, Birth of a Nation said that we needed to be afraid of scary black men. Black males especially were very aware that they could not play threatening characters. They had to be safe characters because as soon as they were threatening, Birth of a Nation memories kept flooding back. That's how long of a shadow this movie had, right? So. Black people found as many ways as they could, black males especially, to be safe. Don't be angry on screen. You're too dumb to be a threat. You're too happy to be a threat. You're too anything to be a threat. Anything that they could think of as an adjective that fit there. They used that in order to avoid the threatening black man stereotype that had been created and perpetuated by Birth of a Nation. 
right? It was very important. The most important consideration for a black man to get ahead in the business was don't be threatening. Don't be threatening. The whites, if they, the whites think that you're threatening, danger. Okay? So let's move on to Carolyn Snowden. Uh, Carolyn Snowden was born in Oakland, California, actually. Uh, born in 1900, she wanted to be an actress, African-American woman, and uh, did what she could in order to enter the industry. Uh, she made a movie called Old Time Kentucky, where she played Lincoln Perry, Step and Fetch It's love interest. Right? This is the first time that an on-screen love relationship between two African-American actors was shown. Before this, maybe you had a married slave or something like that, but you never actually saw them on screen together in any kind of intimacy, right? And we're talking about a hug. So this was the first time that people went, ah, this is what black people in love looks like, right? And that was a big deal. That was a revolutionary thing that they did together. Carolyn Snowden also was, uh, she got her first big role in the famous director, Eric von Stroheim's movie. She made a big stink because she wanted to be in a dressing room that was next to the White Stars because they put her all the way on the other side of the lot next to the bathrooms. And she felt that she had been in enough movies and enough things that she demanded a dressing room next to the White Stars. She got it. That was in 1932, 30 years before segregation ended. All right, that was a woman from Oakland, California. These are names that I feel like should be celebrated in film history so much more than they are. Uh, so when, uh, when I, so Uma asked the question, what do I mean memories flooded back? I mean, memories created by birth of a nation, right? Because that movie left a big impact. It was bigger than Titanic. It was bigger than Gone with the Wind. So the image, oh, and by the way, the other thing, in Birth of a Nation, it was white people in blackface who played the threatening blacks. It was not black actors who played those threatening roles. That's another little piece of a uh, thing. And when I'm saying memories, I mean memories and audiences, right? And black people were very aware of how that looked. Um, okay, we're gonna go to Al Jolson which is a very complicated history. Here's the thing about African-American film history and any minority history. We can look back and we can be like, ooh, bad behavior, right? Like we do with Lincoln Perry. But you have to understand the context from which it comes. Al Jolson was the most famous entertainer in America in the 20s. He was a Jewish man come to the US and he was incredibly famous. And the majority of what he did, he performed in blackface, right? As a black man. Now here's the thing about Al Jolson. Al Jolson is not a racist, was not a racist. Al Jolson loved black people. He was the one that helped Cab Calloway first appear in a nightclub in front of audiences in a segregated nightclub. He was the one that made sure that even though he was in blackface, every one of the performers behind him was actually black. He was the one that brought jazz and other black musical forms to a white audience, making it safe for them, right? By being a white man in blackface, he allowed black culture to be safely consumed by white people. Does that make sense? By being in blackface, he used blackface to make black people safe because they knew it was a white man underneath. Right. Now, when I say that black, when I said the first epic in all of film history was Birth of a Nation, the first sound film in all of history is The Jazz Singer, which starred Al Jolson. Al Jolson, a Jewish guy in a movie called The Jazz Singer. Right? That was even Al Jolson's way of introducing jazz to white audiences and his most famous first sound line, you ain't heard nothing yet. 
is not just about, oh, now you've heard music and sound in movies. It's also about, oh God, there's a whole bunch about this culture of it. You're barely gonna start hearing. That's what Al Jolson me meant in the subtext of that film. The first sound line in all of history was a promise of the value of African-American culture. Okay? So, moving forward from Al Jolson, who, by the way, gets a lot of uh, cri critique nowadays because he was in blackface all the time, right? Al Jolson is seen as a villain in African-American film history because of his use of blackface, and maybe he is. I don't know, that's part of the discussion for later, but he opened a lot of doors, right? The other aspect uh, with Al Jolson is, uh, Oh, the reason he felt such kinship with the African-Americans is because he was a Jew in the 20s and 30s. And he said, there's not that much difference between us. If you can accept us, you can accept them. So there was a solidarity going on between the Jews. Well, not the Jews, but between Al Jolson and Cab Calloway, certain prominent black artists and this prominent Jewish artist, right? which is an interesting uh, beginning to our conversation about allies. We're gonna move on to Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell. These are two names where you would probably know them by their more famous names, which is Amos and Andy. Amos and Andy were two radio characters. Uh, Freeman and Carell were uh, radio comic writers. They're both white. And they were trying to sell a pitch. And they tried to sell a pitch about two white guys like struggling to radio producers. It didn't pick up. And they went, you know what? What about if it's two, uh, two colored guys in the city struggling and not really able to get ahead? What if we pitched a show like that? The radio station loved it, bought the show, and they voiced Amos and Andy. Amos was a naive but hardworking uh, black man who was just trying to get ahead. Andy liked a shortcut. He didn't like to work as hard, but he had grand dreams and grand vision. So it was a buddy story about how these two different black guys would get into hijinks, right? Amos and Andy. It was voiced by two white actors. This is the original. This is blackface for radio. Here's why Amos and Andy is so important. Amos and Andy invented the 25-minute comedic story arc for radio. You know what we call that nowadays? The sitcom. They invented the sitcom on radio. When TV started to become a thing, TV producers said, come on over, come on to TV and make the sitcom. Amos and Andy was the first sitcom, right? Now, here's the thing. Freeman and Carell did not want when it was TV, when it was visual, to still be Amos and Andy. So they did something unheard of. They hired a fully black cast. Amos and Andy are still kind of cartoonish, buffoonish characters, but now black people are playing those characters, right? I'm just gonna stick a link here in the chat. Uh, I, I, we don't need to see it, right? But this is the uh, announcement This link here in YouTube is the announcement of uh, the Black cast, where Freeman and Carell are introducing their Black cast to the audience. Okay, so if you would like, you can watch that later. It's, it's, it's weird because the Black cast is coming out and doing their buffoonish hello kind of thing. But at the same time, you can see that Freeman and Carell are trying to support these Black people by bringing them up front. And it's weird to see something that's so wrong but that's also a sign of progress. What we're seeing are things that are wrong and are weirdly simultaneously signs of progress, right? And that is like something that's very, very strange um, in all of these things. So you have Amos and Andy, which was the first big sitcom. And by the way, when Amos and Andy went off the air, sitcoms are popular for 20 years, but it took until Sanford and Sons 20 years later until there was a black cast in a sitcom again. For 20 years, even though, you know, black characters were the 
formation of the sitcom, for 20 years, there were no black sitcoms between Amos and Andy and Sanford and Sons, okay? Moving right along, I'm gonna skip the story about Marilyn Monroe and Ella Fitzgerald. If you would like to read about it, just Google Marilyn Monroe and Ella Fitzgerald. And there's a little interesting story there about how Ella Fitzgerald kind of got her first big break via Marilyn Monroe, right? Um, okay, Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick in 1955 was a struggling filmmaker. This is, everyone knows Kubrick, right? 2001 Space Odyssey, Dr. Strangelove, all the way to Eyes Wide Shut, Spartacus, like one of the biggest directors in film history. In 1955, he was still kind of struggling as a filmmaker. So he got his friends and family to give him $40,000 to make a movie called Killer's Kiss, right? And Killer's Kiss was about this nightclub dancer played by a white woman who was, uh, who fell in love with a boxer, but she was also being sexually pursued by the threatening nightclub owner played by Frank Silvera, a half black actor, right? There was an interracial kiss here, but in this case, the black man was the villain and the white woman was the victim. It wasn't rape, but she literally says, don't kill me before she kisses him. Clearly afraid for her life before she kisses him. This is Kubrick. This is the movie that launched Kubrick in many ways, right? And so while you have these people like still trying to move away and trying to present black people as non-threatening, you also have these other images coming in in the other direction. Right now, before we judge Frank Silvera too harshly, right, for doing this role and things like that, this is one of Marlon Brando's best friends. He was known as one of the finest actors of his generation. And there were very limited roles for black actors around. And someone asked Marlon Brando, no, Frank Silvera didn't really speak about this, but someone asked Marlon Brando once, why did your friend Frank Silvera play that part if it was so destructive? And Marlon Brando said, well, Frank and I both believe that the only way to change Hollywood is money, not imagery. So you take the money, you get the role, you get big, then they'll listen to you. So you do whatever you have to do in order to get big. That's what we believe. So it wasn't Frank Silvera, in his eyes, selling out his race. It was just doing what he needed to do in order to get big enough where he could make a change, right? You can look up Killer's Kiss, the trailer, on YouTube if you'd like to see how he was presented. Oh, also Kubrick never said he was black in the movie and because it was black and white and Frank Silvero was kind of a light-skinned black guy and he looks fairly clearly black to me looking at it, but that was never, like him being black was never specifically mentioned in the film, right? Um, okay, I wanna talk about Dorothy Dandridge. Dorothy Dandridge was the first African-American actress ever nominated for a Best Actress Award, right? This was for a movie called Carmen Jones. Carmen Jones is a, uh, is a Oscar, uh, Oscar Hammerstein. It, it's the Hammerstein musical version of the original. That's, oh, Lucia, that's Elisa who's over there. She's listening. Um, it's Hammerstein's musical version of the opera Carmen, except it takes place in World War II in an African-American neighborhood. Dorothy Dandridge played basically the African-American Carmen and was nominated for the first time as uh, Best Actress. Now, the thing about Dorothy Dandridge is she's a light-skinned Black woman. She is, she was known pretty much as the first Black female sex symbol. This was kind of brand new that white people would think that a black woman could be a sex symbol at this time. It's kind of crazy. Now she was light skinned, so that helped, all right? But she was, she was very voluptuous. And also in real life, she dated white men. Most of her lovers were white men. And one of the things that she really wanted to break was the taboo of interracial kissing on screen, right? So after she won her best actress nomination, 
which Grace Kelly herself said that Dandridge should have won, right? Uh, Dorothy Dandridge went, okay, how do I make it happen so that I can kiss a white guy on film? Because that's the next taboo that needs to be broken. Okay. Um, so that was, so that uh, Carmen Jones came out in 1954. Uh, so, oh, by the way, she also hated that Carmen was marketed this way. This was the tagline for Carmen, Carmen Jones. That man crazy, dazzle dancing gal, sultry and savage, incendiary, whirling through a jungle world in Bizet's pulsing beat and blood surging musical. All right. The word jungle was literally in the marketing for Carmen Jones. Okay. Uh, so, uh, brr, three years, Dorothy Dandridge took a leave of absence from filmmaking. The reason she took the leave of absence is because she kept looking for the role where they would cast her opposite a white man. In 1957, after a three year absence, there was a movie called Island in the Sun, where she played a West Indies native who has an affair with a white man. However, the motion picture production code had strict rules about how interracial relationships were presented. So instead of a kiss, instead of all of that, the actor John Justin, the white character, has a scene in which he vaguely expresses his love for her. And that's it. No kiss, nothing else. Everything else was taken out of the film. This caused Dorothy Dandridge in 1958 to go work on a French production where she was finally allowed to lock lips with a white man, right? And that movie was released later in 1959, not su a subject to American production codes because it had been created in uh, France with French money, right? So Dorothy Dandridge, the other thing I wanna point out is that her career kind of tanked after all of this because she was seen as a troublesome black woman who was making too many unreasonable demands about what her character needed to be and all this kind of stuff. So when she died, which was, there was an accidental drug overdose, could have been suicide, kind of like a weird Heath Ledger kind of thing. She died, she had less than, she had a little more than $2 in her bank account. That's how Dorothy Dandridge went out, okay? All right, moving on. Uh, John Wayne, one of the heroes of uh, film history, is an admitted white supremacist. He told Play Playboy that he was a white supremacist and he believed that whites were just better than the other races. You can kind of see this in his movies, okay? Uh, just providing a little context here. Uh, let's move forward to Red Fox, who did Sanford and Son, and then I wanna talk about stand-up comedian Dick Gregory. Stand-up comedian Dick Gregory was performing in a, in a uh, stand-up comedy club in 1961 when Hugh Hefner happened to walk in. <clears throat> Dick Gregory, this was one of Dick Gregory's jokes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I understand there are a good many Southerners in the room tonight. I know the South very well. I spent 20 years there one night. Last time I was down South, I walked into this restaurant and this white waitress came up to me and said, we don't serve colored people here. I said, that's all right, I don't eat colored people. Bring me a whole fried chicken. Then these three white boys came up to me and said, boy, we're giving you fair warning. Anything you do to that chicken, we're going to do to you. So I put down my knife and fork. I picked up that chicken and I kissed it. Then I said, line up, boys. <laughs> Hugh Hefner loved Dick Gregory's shtick so much, he personally hired him to be the headliner at the Playboy Club. Dick Gregory's career took off. Now, why do I want to mention these things? What do we say about the minstrel show? Starts off with the buffoon. It goes to wordplay, and then there's a satire of plantation life and slavery. I feel like that's exactly what happened into the 50s. It started off as the buffoon. Then people like Dorothy Dandridge and all of them started having intellectual things until you have Dick Gregory straight up satirizing the racist South and making white people laugh in a nightclub. This is the year before Sidney Poitier slapped a white man. This is what it took 
before Sidney Poitier was allowed to be threatening again, powerful again, and slap a white man. Okay? And that's the first half of it. Now, Sidney Poitier, I want to talk about 1957, which is a banner year in African-American film history, because three Sidney Poitier movies came out in the same year. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, To Sir With Love, and In the Heat of the Night. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner is about a white woman falling in love with Sidney Poitier, a black man, and bringing him home to her parents, who are well-meaning liberals, but uh, I don't know about marrying a black guy, daughter, right? And it's actually a really great movie. The thing is, there aren't intimate scenes between Sidney Poitier and the white woman. The most there is, is a handhold, right? There still is this big taboo at this point in history between showing any kind of, you might even hint at a romantic relationship, but we don't wanna see it. We don't wanna see a black man touching a white woman. This is because of the long shadow cast by lynchings, birth of a nation, everything right but Sidney Poitier is moving the needle and he's the first one to really move the needle with positive interpretations of black characters that don't need to be buffoons that don't need to be cartoonish Sidney Poitier characters are charming capable intelligent smart strong all of these kinds of things and he's the first one that manages to pull this off and everyone credits Sidney Poitier with this but Look how much it took for him to be able to get there, right? And look how many other careers it took for him to be able to get there. So Sidney Poitier is one of my personal heroes. And I've been studying him a lot because at one point I even wanted to write a biopic about Sidney Poitier, right? The thing about Sidney Poitier is he was born in the Bahamas, in Cat Island in the Bahamas. What is it about the Bahamas? There's three major African-American figures in film history that have come from the Bahamas. Someone asked Sidney Poitier that. Why the Bahamas? And he said, well, here's the thing. Everyone's poor in the Bahamas. Everyone thinks that racism is something you are born with, Sidney Poitier said. Except the thing is, you disprove that when you're on an island where everyone is poor. Racism is created by wealth, not by natural innate xenophobia. Right, those aren't his words, I'm paraphrasing. But his thesis, which is in his autobiography, his thesis was that he grew up on an island where the white people and the black people were poor farmers. And nobody hated anybody else because they were all trying to make a buck. And it took him moving to the US where there was wealth and poverty, where he suddenly realized he was lesser than according to these white people. And that was a real culture shock for him. And he said, one of the reasons I was be able to be as brave as I was in my film career is because I spent the first formative years of my life thinking racism is bullshit and I'm equal to anybody. He didn't grow up in America. So when he came to America, somebody called him the N-word, he went, <laughs> loser. He wasn't burdened with all of this history. And that's a very interesting thought to me, this idea that racism is not born in us, but actually requires money, either an income disparity or just the existence of wealth at all in order to turn racism into a thing, right? That's really interesting and something I'd love to uh, discuss later. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start to move pretty quickly as we start to get into the uh, modern era. We're gonna move into the black exploitation genre. This is around the time in the 60s that the Black Panthers are really rising in power. Black men are sick and tired of pretending to not be threatening. They're sick and tired of pretending like, hey, we don't scare you. They're like, we scare you and we're cool with it. That was what the Black Panthers were comfortable with. And that simultaneously created the black exploitation genre. Characters like Shaft, played by Richard Brown, Roundtree, Foxy Brown, played by Pam Greer, right? All of these things. I also want to point out there was a movie that came out called Mandingo, produced by white people, but starring a lot of black people. Mandingo was about a well endowed slave who came from Africa and when, was then used 
as a uh, to sleep with all the other slaves to create more slaves, right? And this was a kind of soft porn, very sexual, wasn't life on the plantation, sexy in kind of a scary way. You know, there's a master who sleeps with his uh, black slave, Mandingo sleeps with everyone. Like, you can look up this film, it's called Mandingo, you can look up the trailer, right? Um, and this was, this was like a sexual satire of plantation life. A sexual satire of slavery and plantation life. All right, now we come back to the NAACP, who was never a fan of black exploitation films. They felt that this was only scaring white people and it wasn't actually helping the black cause. Right, so the black exploitation genre was actively hated by members of the black community who are like, mm, slow down. We don't want them to hate us. We don't want this to go back in time. Don't get too threatening. And this led to a period in the 70s uh, of sitcoms, the 70s and 80s of sitcoms of basically the unassuming harmless black man, right? The Cosby Show, uh, all of these in the 70s and 80s, the TV shows were, look, they're safe. They're family people. Let's not be threatening. Let's not, uh, let's not get too crazy here, right? Bill Cosby straight up said, you know, just because you're a thug doesn't make you powerful. All this kind of stuff. We started going from Richard Pryor to a more quiet kind of friendly comedian, which is interesting because believe it or not, Richard Pryor was first uh, introduced to comedy by Bill Cosby, right? Totally different styles, but kind of interlocking history here. So you have that, that era of the, honest, the driving Miss Daisy era, if you will, right? Of film history. I wanna move forward and then we get to Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington is really, really interesting to me because Denzel Washington saw what Sidney Poitier did and said, I want that. But Denzel Washington was also very aware of how black people were being presented, right? So if he started to see that uh, black African-American actors and males were being presented as flawless, the magical black man, the driving Miss Daisy black man, he played flawed characters. Right? I mean, he's played a lot of flawed characters, whether an out of time, you know, it, they're people that are cheating on their wives, all this kind of stuff. When people were afraid of Black people being powerful, he made Malcolm X and those civil rights movies. He did everything he could to show the different side of the African American experience than the stereotype at the time. And that's how he presented his three dimensionality. The other taboo that Denzel Washington wanted to break, which, by the way, a uh, sex scene between a black man and a white woman was still a difficult sell right now. They done it in like Mandingo style movies. But when we're talking about the big blockbusters, mm, we don't need that. Denzel Washington was supposed to have an on-screen kiss with white actress M. Beth Davidson Fallen. It was removed in the script phase. In the movie Man on Fire, in I think that was 2004, right? He had a kiss with Rod, Rava Mitchell that was filmed. You can see the deleted scene. It's really innocuous. They're kissing in a car, right, while it's raining outside. You can hardly see anything. That scene was cut out of Man on Fire in 2004, right? Because why do we want to complicate this action movie with a kiss between a white man and a, uh, a black man and a white woman? Right? Denzel Washington frequently had to play romantic interests with Puerto Ricans, with Hispanics, with a lot of this type, because it's like, look, look, Denzel, that's fine for those little movies, but this is a big blockbuster. We need everyone to like it. Right? That can't be done. So Denzel Washington's biggest interracial relationships are in Spike Lee movies that are meant to challenge and provoke. Right, Malcolm X, because Malcolm X in real life was sent to jail for being with a white woman. So you can't tell the Ma Malcolm X biopic without doing that scene, right? And in He Got Game, he's literally in uh, bed with two porn stars, actual porn stars who were cast as extras in that role. Because you wouldn't want, I mean, it was very difficult to get a white actress 
to agree to do that naked scene for just that moment with a black man and not really have another part beside that. So they cast porn stars in that part, right? This is all, and that was in He Got Game. This is mind boggling, right? So finally, I wanna to come to Will Smith as we're moving through history. And by the way, I know I'm skipping so much. I know I'm speeding through so much because if we were to talk about every single person, this is this is a year long class. So I'm just trying to go through the big points and the big evolutions as best as I can. Will Smith, so we went from all of these people to Sidney Poitier to Denzel Washington and Will Smith basically from a, a very young age went, I wanna do what Denzel's doing, but bigger. I wanna do the biggest movies, but with all of these things. And Fresh Prince was successful, so he was able to do Independence Day, which I just recently rewatched Independence Day. It's stunning to me that Will Smith isn't introduced in that movie for the first 22 minutes. They introduce all the white leads in that film. They pretend that it's not a black lead blockbuster for so long before Will Smith comes on the scene, right? And I actually think that's smart. I'm not knocking the makers of that film. I think that when they did these things, all of these things were strategic. They made a movie that played to Will Smith's strengths, but they knew at the time that marketing him above the fold would not work. Jeff Goldblum, on the other hand, white people love Jeff Goldblum. Right, so it's so it was a very like bait and switch. You think you're getting a Jeff Goldblum movie? Ha ha! It's Will Smith, right? You think you're getting the Fly? You're getting the Fresh Prince, right? And that movie made buckets of movie. That is the first movie with a black lead that broke over two hundred million dollars at the box office. Will Smith was the first bankable African American lead because of that movie. And July 4th was officially Will Smith Day. He released Men in Black on July 4th. He released the first Bad Boys on July 4th. Movie after movie. Every summer, Will Smith ruled, proving that white people would go see a movie, a big blockbuster movie, with a black lead. Right? It wasn't until 2015. Five years ago. Oh, in Men in Black 2, Will Smith has a romance with Linda Fiorentino, but it's just flirtatious talk. They never kiss. They never do anything. That's Men in Black 2. It wasn't until 2015 when Will Smith was in focus with Margot Robbie that he straight up had sex scenes with a white woman. 2015, five years ago. In a big budget, more than a $100 million film where there was a love scene between a black man and a white woman. 1915, Birth of a Nation came out. 2015, Focus came out. A hundred years before a black man was able to romantically be with a white woman in a major Hollywood film. That is the shadow that Birth of a Nation cost. And how much work that all of these people had to do in order to get to the point where that was acceptable. Since then, what I'm encouraged by is since the advent of Will Smith and Independence Day and all of these movies, the world has changed a lot more quickly. What used to change over 30 years has been changing over five years, right? I can't like turn on the TV without seeing interracial couples in every commercial, in every movie. Like it's, it's just completely different now, right? And that's good. I do want to say, though, in the past uh, in the past five years, there have been so many more, in the past 10 years, there have been so many more African-American male and female actors who have been nominated, who have won awards, who have headlined, and this is the important one, who have headlined big movies that have made a lot of money. Will Smith led to Chadwick Boseman in Black Panther, and a billion-dollar movie. Right? Will Smith led to Idris Elba. Right? Uh, I want to talk, go back in time and mention a few other notable things. Lawrence Fishburne in Othello in the 70s kissed a white woman. Why? Othello, even in the Shakespearean play, is a black guy in a relationship with a white woman. It's just doing Shakespeare right. So that did happen, but that was not a movie that was widely seen. And in fact, there's a 
they paired the trailer of Othello with Waiting to Exhale. And one of the, uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there, I think it was Wanda Sykes. It was Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes did a whole thing about how she went to see the Waiting to Exhale premiere. And when uh, the Othello trailer played, she heard all of the black women around her saying, what's Lawrence Fishburne doing kissing that white woman? Right? And then Waiting to Exhale, for those of you that have seen it, is kind of about that topic. And when the black people end up with the black people, all the black women in the audience were happy. So Wanda Sykes actually makes the point that it didn't just take so long for the black and the white thing to come together just because of the white people. There was a lot of antagonism towards interracial couples from the minority side too. So that's, that's another factor that we have to consider within the larger context of all of these things, right? Um, I also want to talk about Halle Berry. Halle Berry actually shot to fame playing Dorothy Dandridge in an HBO film called Introducing Dorothy Dandridge because Halle Berry was a huge fan of Dorothy Dandridge and all that she had done, right? Halle Berry the, has a, I want to say almost violently graphic sex scene with Billy Bob Thornton in Monster's Ball for which she won the Oscar. A white man having profoundly rough sex with a black woman came years before it came the other way around. Okay? Because, as we said, lynchings, this history, social history, black man as a threat to white woman was one of the largest tropes. Now, where does this, all of this leave us? This all leads to the ultimate point that from the beginning of, I mean, in, during the times of slavery, and I'm just talking about film history, but in so many different contexts, a black man has been seen as a threat, has been defined as a threat, as something we need to protect against. That has been something that film history has been trying to, and these people in film history have been trying to combat for so long, right? But it, they were seen as a threat. So, and that's societal programming, that's film programming, that's media programming, that's so many of these things, right? In 1960, Harper Lee wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, in which a black man is falsely accused of raping a white woman. He's defended by a white lawyer. And all of these things are happening. I mean, I'm sure everyone's read To Kill a Mockingbird. That came out in 1962, right? All of these things had to happen. Movements from both white and black people working together strategically to defeat the mechanisms and the societal brainwashing that racism had perpetuated. It's easy to look back at the minstrel show now and go, oh, black people play, playing the buffoon. They held us back. But in another context, maybe they actually moved it forward, moved the dial forward. I don't know. That's what they believed they were doing. And in many ways, it's you can see how that led to the next thing, right? What is the right behavior for a white ally? Is what Al Jolson did when he wore blackface wrong? Is it cultural appropriation? Or did he actually move the black cause forward even while in blackface? These things are all so confusing. And yet in 2020, we still live in a period where a white police officer sees a black man, and the first thing he sees is a threat. And that's kind of the broad overview of this historical analysis. It's not in depth. It's not, you know, uh, it's not perfect because in order to do that, it would take quite a bit more time, right? But I personally split film history into those two parts, getting to Sidney Poitier and then getting from Sidney Poitier to focus in 2015, which it wasn't even that successful of a film, but still iconically has that love scene, right? Um, that's the lecture portion of this. Now, I know this is a very tense time and there's a lot going on and there's a lot of emotion and feelings going on in the world. So I want to start with a question based on this. Do you all believe that racism 
is inherently born within us from xenophobia. Like racism is just this organic thing we're born with, this fear of the other, this fear of someone who looks different than us. Or like uh, Sidney Poitier said, is it a product of wealth and money? Is money what causes racism or is it something else altogether? What do you guys think? Uh, please raise your hand if you would like to speak and I'll call on you. Dave, go ahead. So I wasn't born here. I came here as a teenager. I, I feel, at least in America, it's the uh, desire to have the authority and power um, created racism more than the money. Um, white people wanted to rule. They wanted to um, have power, authority. Um, and, and I've seen, I don't know how many of you have seen Boys in the Hood. It's one of my, um, where Lawrence Fishburne was telling his son what to be aware of um, in the society, the hidden ailments. Um, so amazing uh, dialogue that scene is. So yeah, that's, Thank you, that's my- so, uh, so power creates racism. And by the way, I this does seem like a major oversight, but I left out Spike Lee and John Singleton because I feel like so much time is devoted to them that a lot of people already are aware of that. So I try to look at it from a different angle, but Spike Lee and John Singleton are absolutely major players in this. Kalpana. Yeah, so I uh, grew up in India, so I spent my formative years in India, but I did spend another set of formative years in East Africa, in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And I would say that uh, no sort of color for me certainly was, was uh, sort of included into me when I was a child. Uh, and I do want to say that it's perpetuated in India by constant notion that someone who's fair is also a good person, right? A fair person is sort of associated with everything lovely and milk and all of that stuff. Uh, and another person is not perpetuated when, you, when you're uh, in the matrimonial ads. So I, I, I think it's something, um, it's something foisted on you by a parent or, a, or, or people around you, society basically. Does anyone here believe that racism is something that we are born with? That xenophobia is just something naturally created within us, a fear of the other that we then have to defeat? No one wants to take that one? Mm -mm. Interesting. Shelly, go ahead. I think it's passed down in our families. I think that even um, even if you think your, your family is pretty progressive and, um, and colorblind, that there are still biases or whatever that come through. And, um, and certainly in some families and in some regions of the, of our country, for sure, it's more, you know, racism is actually taught. Um, you know, parents, parent to child, and friend to friend, but um, that's always been my theory: is that it's 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 taught, and you know, and it, it might be uh, accidental or unintentional or whatever, but that's what I okay. think. Gabe. Um. I think it's taught to, um, I heard something yesterday. It was like white people are, have been afraid to like give more power to, um, people of color because they're afraid that if the tables were turned, that they, they're afraid of how they would, they were, they're afraid of, they would treat them how they've been treated. And so it's like, even if you don't hate, like if you're a white kid and you're growing up and you don't hate black people, but if your parents kind of instill in you like, hey, if we don't keep this power, I don't know what they're going to do to you. I don't know what's going to happen. You know? And I can see how that can like, that fear can like overcome them, you know, to just continue what they're generationally have been doing to just keep power to their, their own safety. 
Well, uh, Deanna. Um, it's so crazy to hear you talk about how Sydney theorized that it came from money. Cause I was literally telling my friend Kelly today that I think a huge issue is capitalism and how we assign, literally assign people's value with how much they make. And because of like systemized racial systems, most minorities are poor or have less money. And then we literally assign them with less value through monetary means. And so I totally think it's related. I don't know if that's the only place that it comes from, but I think that's a huge way that we continue to perpetuate racism through mo monetary value. And I hate money, I hate money, but I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. Um, uh, I want to I wanna go back to the minstrel show structure, right? Uh, you know how I broke it into the three-part structure of the minstrel show? Did anybody have any thoughts about that, about how the earliest freed slaves planned on using entertainment to make white people empathize with them, even by playing the buffoons that white people expected them to be? Did anybody have any thoughts or feelings about that? I have questions about it. Like, did they think this is the best way to get ahead, even if it goes against our, the, our grain of the way we feel, because this is a way to make money? Or I don't know if it was a way to make money. I think it was just a way to connect with the audience before changing their mind, is how they thought about it. Uh, but then, of course, it was co-opted and appropriated by whites who did not follow that structure at all. Uma, go ahead. Uh, I think, I mean, I would like to understand the context of it a little bit more, because to me, uh, the thought was, it's just, it's so frustrating that, that, that the goal was to get the oppressors to empathize with them. And to me, what made me angry about that was I wish that they could just just live for their own selves you know and to to have to do to have to work so hard as an entertainer to get your oppressor to sympathize with you that that really made me sad so i mean it was there more context to that like well, well it's I sad it's sad is true um uh, but there's a lot of reactions going in here. jd i think you had your hand up for a while well, and then i'll well, try to add a little more context if i can yeah, I mean, I would like more context too, but I mean, I feel like in that situation, and it's so complicated, but what is the right move? Because like they can't do what we're doing today in 2020, or can they? You know what I mean? And what would it have been like if they were to do what we're doing today? If like, one of them had just been Sidney Poitier, it wouldn't have gone for them the way it did for Sidney Poitier if they tried to do that in the, in the 20s. You know, yeah. so I think that's a good question. Go on, JD. Well, that I mean, that's just the thing. It's like, yeah, what, what, what is the right move then? Was it the right move then? And then for today, how does that apply today? And like, what's the right move now? You know what I mean? Like, it's for me, this whole situation, I've been like, who is, what do we do? Because I'm confused, you know, even as just an entertainer, but also as a human being um, dealing with racism and how do we stop it? Well, it's the interest, it's the central question of these protests, right? The violent protest or the peaceful protest? Do we demand empathy or do we work really hard to produce empathy? What do we do? Right. Yes, which one is more moral? Which one is more effective? Uh, I, I think that's something that minorities have been asking for a long time. Uh, do you play the stereotype that you're presented and slowly try to work within the system and change it, or do you just burn the system down? And we've seen both of those examples happen in film history. So, Lucia. Um. Uh, um. Really, uh, I think both. I think both of them. I think there's a lot of there's a different level of awareness among people. I think that's probably what the minstrels were were trying to do, realizing where they were 
it took a high level of awareness on their part. Like we know how we're seen and therefore we're gonna try to inch this forward in whatever way that we can. Um, I think that's what Abraham Lincoln was doing, right? There's a lot of evidence that he actually believed that um, black should be equal, but he could never say that. He was a president. He was gonna, I think he was really good at reading the society and what they would be willing to accept and when, um, you know, whether or not that was good or enough or whatever. Um, and I think that that, you know, it's sad. It's sad that we live in this society where you have to do that, right? And like, you know, you wish you could wave a wand and not, and not have to do that and have people see people for who they are. Um, but I think I, you know, going back to the first question, I think it is, it's money, it's power. You know, people don't like to give up their power. Um, and I think that's just human, maybe not human nature. It's like the kind of the bad part of human nature, right? You get power, you get recognition. People don't want to give that up. And whether it's, I was having this discussion with people at like my work today, like, oh, someone gets a little bit of power, maybe they get a little bit, like they become a supervisor and now all of a sudden they're acting different, right? Than they were when they were your colleague. Tiny little way of people behaving differently and not wanting to give up power when they get it. So this is like magnified, you know, a million times that they somehow got the power made yeah i mean yeah i i think what stuns me when i look at all of this stuff is in my head i knew like if you look up interracial sex scene focus like you'll see a bunch of articles on like whoa this is a big deal right about a 2015 film my head when i was like putting together this class i was telling lisa that's 2012 right my head five years had to become eight because there was no way that that was just five years ago and it was just five years ago and i think it's really uh i think what's really crazy about is how recent this stuff is um nihar how old are you right now uh i'm 16. Uh, he's 16 <laughs> right he's the youngest kid, uh, youngest person in this room and nihar was already like when friends he was born when friends and all of these are it wasn't even expected that there needed to be minority characters in a cast do you know what I mean? It's like so much of this stuff is so recent. Um, and yes, I know that Ross dated a black woman once. Um, you know, but it's like how I met your mother was not that long ago. And it's predominantly a white cast. Like these things being real issues is a very, very recent phenomenon. It's stunningly recent phenomenon built on the backs of so many people who've been working for so many, so many years. And I think that hurts. Sometimes when I think about how recent some of this stuff is, it really does hurt. Yes, Dave, go ahead. Um, so I went to school in uh, Rutgers University, Newark, New Jersey, historically black, black city, um, the largest city in, in New Jersey. Uh, so this is my own experience. I was also, I have a minor in broadcast journalism. I was a journalist for four years, so as to cover that city. And I noticed, you know, by the way, here you can buy, to give you a quick, quick one sentence context, you can buy a liquor in California, in, in a gas station, in a, a pharmacy, everywhere. Over there, you can only buy it at a liquor store, only at a liquor store. And if you go to a white neighborhood, the liquor stores are very few and far in between. In a uh, a, a minority neighborhood, a black or Latino, especially black neighborhoods. Every four blocks, every four blocks, there's a liquor store, a convenience store, come liquor store, and I see these poor blacks who are like drinking and just hanging outside. It's kind of intentionally there. Those cities are underfunded with their schools, so that they can never come up. The white neighborhoods, there's so if you, like for example of New Jersey, because I grew up there. There's so many small, small unincorporated cities out there. Um, uh, it, it, New Jersey itself is so small and there's so many small cities in there so that they can, the white people have their, can their own, I'm sorry if somebody's white here, not to offend you, their own rich neighborhood protected where if, 
in kind of if you want to buy real estate that is difficult for a black person it's also subtle and subliminal but very strategic and coming just one last thing and I'll mute myself and, and I, I as a as somebody who wasn't born here I see uh, if you if you all of you see entertainment industry ba Hollywood even Bollywood hip-hop is the foundation of entertainment in music everything you see today you see a white movie you see a spider-man they have these uh, action scene going on something you want to play any kind of music there'll be hip-hop or some kind of music that will to hip-hop not necessarily pop but when it comes to black they are Oscars majority time even today there are very few fine between uh, thing goes through minority so I, I just don't understand this yeah. it, it frustrates it's, me it's it's absolutely systemic and that's I think that's what's really hard you see the slow way the slow way that step and fetch it and step and Amos and Andy and all of this, the slow incremental way, you see that it takes a hundred years, right? In order to actually get your oppressors to empathize with you and to create any kind of change. And it is uh, slow. And also it becomes very complicated in terms of being an ally. I'm not black. What is the proper way to being an ally? Is Al Jolson a bad guy or a good guy? Without Marilyn Monroe, Ella Fitzgerald's career doesn't get launched. What is the proper way to be an ally? Al Jolson straight up culturally appropriated jazz in modern language in order to promote it. Bad guy, good guy, I don't know. Like it's, I, I feel like part of the reason that it's so frustrating to me right now is we want change. So many of us want the same thing, but the hows, and all of that are so clear. It's like, to me, this isn't even necessarily a black versus white issue. I feel like every white person in this room would, you know, is absolutely on the same side that we all are. I'm Indian on the same side. It's all, we're all united, but what do we do? Where do we go? And we can't even look back at our history and clearly say, this good strategic behavior led here. This bad behavior did not work. It all worked in different ways, in minute ways, working together. There is no right answer. And I think that's what's most frustrating for me right now. Deanna. What's frustrating for me, tagging on to what you're saying, is like, I, like you said, want to see change. And I want people to start sharing ideas. And I don't feel safe sharing an idea I might have. Like, I want people to start coming up with ways of how we can start making change. But I think we're so scared of doing the wrong thing because looking back like we did through history, it can be seen as like, well, that was a racist thing. But like, it's all relative, right? So like with the context of what we're going through now, it's hard to know what is the perfect move. And I think that's holding a lot back because we need to start making moves and trying things and failing maybe and making mistakes and learning and growing from them. But there's so much for me, fear in taking the wrong step and, and offending someone. And like, I don't feel like it's, I just don't know how, but I really want the change and I have ideas, but I'm just too scared to share them openly. <laughs> um, the, uh, you kind of answered your own question in that statement. Um, I've had a lot of people reach out to me on Instagram in light of things. Uh, are you okay? What can I do? Um, I just want you to know, like, I, like, though I don't understand, like, your struggle, like, I, I am here. I am raising my sons to be anti-racist men in this world, you know? And, like, and I had someone tell me, I don't know what the right thing to say is. I don't know, whatever, but I, this is what I want you to know. And that's already like, like me, I'm not gonna make you feel less than if you say the wrong thing. You know what I mean? Like the fact that you want the change is already beautiful, like in my viewpoint. Like it's, and you gotta like surround yourself with people that like you feel safe around. Like, you know, you could always call me, text me, whatever. I'm never gonna be like, oh, Deanna, that was real racist. Why you say that? You know what I mean? Like, that's that's just not, because I see that, and I know when you're genuine, 
and you're not trying to be, you know, have your own agenda to try to make me less than, you know, like, cause I just know you and I know your heart. So you can just call me anytime. But like, I think premising like, Hey, I don't know what the right thing to say is, but this is what, this is what I would like to do. And I want to know your viewpoint on this. And whoever's offended by that, just, they just got some stuff they got to work on. <laughs> Uma, I'm going to call on you in a second, but I want to bring back what Jennifer just said to the minstrel show, because that I think is the context you're looking for, Uma. It wasn't necessarily creating a context within which your oppressors would have empathy for you. I think it was more creating a context in which there was a safe environment in which ideas could be discussed back and forth. Creating, you know, it's like, I'll give you this, and now we have an environment in which we're all safe where anything could be said. Right. And now I can talk about how much it sucked to be a slave and I can satirize plantation life. And if you could create that safe environment where everyone could communicate, then you've made progress. And I think that was actually the goal of the original minstrel, uh, minstrel, re, minstrel, re, that's a hard word to say, minstrel reprograms. Uh, Uma. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's what film is, right? It's the, it's that safe space for ideas to be shared. Um, but I want also to respond to Deanna and comment on the, the lecture is what was interesting to me about all of the names you said, Vijay, is they all had these baby step goals in mind. Like, I want to have a kiss with a white man on screen. That's a very tangible, specific goal, you know? It's not, I want to end racism. It's not, I want everybody to be equal because it's like, we don't know what that looks like. A black woman having a kiss with a white man on screen, we know exactly what that looks like. That's something we can now make moves to, to achieve. And I think that's a really interesting takeaway from this is, is I mean, you know, I have that helpless feeling too. It's like, I don't know what to do, but, but maybe thinking about it in terms of well, what are some tangible baby step goals that we can um, aspire to in order to achieve that can push the needle forward even more. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna comment on somebody like Kristen Bell, who, for example, seeks out projects since House of Lies uh, into The Good Place, and there's one more example I can't think of. She deliberately pairs herself in projects with romantically with black men, right? Does anybody notice this about Kristen Bell? Like, look at The Good Place with, yeah, Veronica Mars, there was, uh, there was, she even asked the showrunner, Rob Thomas, if there it was, there could ever be a possibility of romance between her and Wallace. And Rob Thomas said, uh, too early. And then starting since then, it's like, since she's had more power, she has moved forward with that. You know, so it's, uh, yeah, there are there are allies. It's crazy how many allies there have been in order to push the needle forward as well. African-American film history is not just African-American film history. You can't do it without talking about Al Jolson. Uh, any other thoughts? Any other feelings? Lucia? Yeah. So um, just on that, I mean, I think that all that... Um, fits well you all, you all know my my work right in social work so when you're when you're um looking to change ideas when you're looking to change behaviors um there's this idea of name's escaping me now but there's sometimes when you can make big changes right away right you can talk to somebody you know they have like a you know insight and they're able to make these big changes most of the time the change is slow so you kind of, the whole premise is um, with social work, with therapy, same thing. You start where they are, start where the person is. So if they're in this place where they're not like, you know, going back to, you're saying the minstrel, they're not even seeing someone as a, as a human or as like any way that you could get them to see and to inch forward, that's what you do. So nowadays, um, kind of like Uma was saying, right? You see, where are we now? how can we move forward and right now there's so many people in so many different places so for me that's what's um i get frustrated when people say like i want to unfriend someone my racist friend or my friend that said a comment that i didn't like and i see uh, white people say this 
And to me, like, no, I can't afford, we can't afford for you just to unfriend somebody. You need to have the conversation with them and move them forward any little bit that you can, because you never know where it's going to lead. And that's one thing that I know and I've discovered some that sometimes you're not going to see what that conversation leads to. Um, they, you might even get an argument, you might even get defensiveness, but you don't know where they're going to end up when they leave you right in like the next week or the next year or whatever. Um, so for me, every conversation is a valuable one. Um, it's worth it to start, you know, explaining things. Um, I don't expect like in this case, I don't expect black people to do that. Um, I think it's, you know, other, like if you want to be an ally, I think that's the kind of thing that an ally could do. Yeah. Um, another thought, uh, there is, so I've done a lot of research given some uh, documentary I made in the past and all of this about uh, healing from sexual abuse and sexual uh, trauma. And one of the things that a therapist said to me while I was doing the research for this was, the most harmful thing to the psychology of a person who has been through this thing is the idea that no one else will ever understand. Mm -hmm. People who have been through sexual trauma like to look at the rest of the world and say, you'll just never understand because you haven't been through what I've been through. And yet that doesn't help them. It doesn't move them forward. And I feel like what you were saying earlier, Jennifer, when you're saying, just because you're not black, I'm not going to dismiss your thoughts or your feelings and just be like, you're never going to understand. That's an important component of it, right? It's like, yeah, obviously the allies have this behavior, behavioral shift too, but it's like the minorities have to be open to that conversation as well. And while I'm saying that, I'm also the same guy that says that Martin Luther King, I know people went like Martin Luther King versus Malcolm X, nonviolence won. Nonviolence is the good thing. But to me personally, I don't think that Martin Luther King is successful without Malcolm X. Without Malcolm X, I think Martin Luther King is the radical that's too with, with his crazy ideas over there. With Malcolm X, it's like, we'll take that one, right? And it becomes a more acceptable, moderate plan. So it's like, it's almost like half have to be peaceful and half have to be violent in order to push the needle forward. Half have to be talking and half have to be demanding. And it, that's kind of what we've seen in history, which is interesting. Kalpana. Well, I just wanted to say that... Um... I, I have approached this, and it's so strange, the timing of it all, because last May, I was reading Becoming, and that led me to a slew of other books. So um, a little after that, Toni Morrison died, and I felt terribly guilty that being a writer, I hadn't even read a single one of her books. So I started reading her books. That also led me to Nelson Mandela's book. So, I mean, I've educated myself and it turns out that I, I, was, in, I was in Cincinnati in October. That led me to the Underground Railroad Museum and to Colson Whitehead's book. So I, I think a lot of it is also seeking out the education. Um, so that for people like me who came to America, I came here when I was 23, so I didn't go through American history either. So I, you know, well, even those of us here really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, and that's why I appreciate all of you taking time out of your evenings to come join us for this conversation. You know, uh, Jennifer. I think JD had my question earlier. What do you think is the now, um, needs to be progressed forward when it comes to um, Black people and how they're portrayed in films? What's the next step for Black women, Black men, whatever, black, just Black? Uh, Dave seems to have an idea. What's next, Dave? Besides people like Spike Lee, I want more white people to make films on Black. Prominent white people like the mainstream Instead of making necessarily making movies that are uh, whatever the trend is going on, like the superheroes which make mo money or action films are, are coming out on the 4th of July, I want them to make mo movies on reality 
uh, trends like a web series where they're more real, more about normal people, you and I. Um, and and that's kind of question I'm afraid, which I already discussed with you yesterday, Vijay. This cycle, uh, you know, every news has a cycle. This news cycle might go on much longer, six months or a year. What happens after that? Racism comes back to America. It'll still be there so on a maybe on a lot more subliminal level, not on this mainstream level, uh, and that would be even worse. I, 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 what I am myself haven't found the answer, and I keep asking everyone, which I'm asking right now to you, Jennifer, who is younger here. What could be done to make sure that this new cycle, not just in the entertainment industry but in real life, continues uh, forever, the flame burning, and, and so that this. So, so they, yeah. uh, we'll answer that question in a second. So we'll come back to your question, but I do want to finish answering Jennifer's question before we move into the next one, right? What's the next taboo? And then we'll talk into how do we, how do we keep this consistent, right? So hold off just a second, Dave. It's like, let's talk about what's the next taboo. What's the next thing that we haven't seen that we want to see? Uma? Um, I think the next thing is uh, more like um, stories that are not about uh, like the social situations that are not about racism specifically, where the characters happen to be black. I mean, authentically, not just like a generic character who happens to be played by a black person. A character who just happens to be black and is in a story. I think that's the next big blockbuster we need. Um, because I mean, we had Black Panther, but that was very, it was, it was politically charged, you know? Um, not as much as, as some of these other ones are, but that's, that's what I think is we need them to just happen to be uh, in stories. It's so interesting when you think about that too. My bad. I just jumped in <laughs> without raising my hand. Um, but like when we talk about the moments in history, right? These were big moments. Like you've never seen that, right? And like when I hear like, oh, let's just, they just should be a story. It should just be a story. How do you sell that? Because it's like, would you go see a movie that's just like a, random story i don't know if i would go see one yeah i see what you mean we've gone from the slap herd around the world to you know uh uhura and captain kirk's kiss on tv which was the for in star trek that was a big yeah. deal right i mean we've gone from those big moments as he said to it's like you whatever you can think of we've kind of seen it but i think what we haven't necessarily proved is that I think, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, Jennifer. I think I'm struggling to find that out for myself. I, I would to answer your question about what's next. I think for me is to actually get past these questions of like authentic, authentically black or authentically black, uh, white or all of these things to actually live in a world because this is the world I think our kids generation lives in and beyond is a world where culture isn't defined by color where they all kind of have their own, they're mixed now. Every kid is mixed. I don't care how pure-blooded they are. Every kid is mixed now. Their culture is mixed. Their thoughts are mixed, all this kind of stuff. And I don't know that we're necessarily the right ones to answer this question. Maybe Nihar is. It's like, I, I feel like there is a generation now that is growing up with so much diversity, at least in our part of the country that the way they think is fundamentally different in some ways. Uh, at least I hope so. I don't know. Maybe Nihar's generation is screwed too. I don't know. <laughs> oh. so Nihar, what do you think? What do you want to see, Jennifer? What do you want to see? I want to see, I want us to win Oscars without having to betray some type of suffering, like slavery, uh, uh, freaking uh, Denzel Washington and Training Day. Like there's always some like 
uh, Jennifer Hudson, her baby daddy had to leave her. Like, there's always, like, Monique, she won that Oscar for being a shitty-ass mother to Precious. There's always a, um, like, a problem. There's always a, ooh, she cried so ugly, so good. You know, there's always a problem. And I'm, I'm over that, <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's go back to Dave's question then, because I think Dave's question is a important one. How do we keep the emotion and the thoughts and the conversation in the air after these protests are done? Jennifer? I literally asked, and my job has been holding space for people going through this um, time uh, in different ways it's so hard because you gotta like, you gotta really care. It, it's like a everyday, like not, it's, I myself um, have not f felt such rage and pain until quarantine happened. I feel like quarantine made me really sit and see and feel everything that has accumulated for hundreds of like i felt like it all like just ugh. and now i'm just like oh well my life's never the same ever again so like ev like i feel like every day you have to like how i'm how am i gonna dismantle racism today like how like it is so so fucked up to like but it has to be a, a a lifestyle. Everybody say it's not a moment; it's a movement. No, like your life, like your everyday life, you need to figure out how am I contributing to this buffoonery, or how am I contributing to make this world as equal as we want it to be. So, to answer your question, it's a daily. Like you, you have to want to make it a part of your life every single day and you can't forget about it it can't be my fear is that this is going to be a wave sure like a good you know it's quarantine everybody's been in the house like oh we have a reason to go out now no you need to understand like what is happening yeah so yeah uh vicky's got her hand raised so i'm gonna call on her i did want to say, real though, quick? It was interesting that what was that, Lucia? I just want to say real quick, because when you said that, like your everyday moment, it has to be an everyday thing. And it's almost like, you know how there's microaggressions that happen like all the time, every day. It almost has to be like that for the good shit, right? So yeah. micro, I don't know what would be the opposite of aggression, but micro acknowledgements micro i don't know <laughs> i think it's still aggressions it's just in the other direction uh, right. i, I do want to call on vicky but before that isn't it interesting that i do feel like being in shelter in place had a completely different reaction to george floyd than oh. Eric Turner or michael brown or all of this it's like the fact that people had a little time to think really oh, made yeah. it this time oh yeah and uh so maybe it's like when we go back to work maybe we should allow ourselves to have a little bit of time not think about these things. Uh, Vicky. Vicky, are you there? Okay. Hello. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm like still moving, so. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I just wanted to share. Sorry, like, um, so. Vicky, I love you. I can't hear nothing you saying, girl, at all. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I remember, like, the first time. The system is keeping us silent, man. All right. <laughs> I can't really hear you. All right. Sorry, Vicky. I am interested to hear your point. Perhaps you could uh, fill us in by chat. 
Uh, uh, Vijay, I want to mention, um, in like relevant to what you, your, uh, the whole theme of the lecture, which is, you know, black men being presented as a threat to white women, white women, and the, I think personally, the biggest evidence of how far we've come is, um, is it? Sorry, Uma. Can you mute me? I can't. It's fine. I can't. <laughs> I don't seem to be able to. I'll keep trying. Are we good? Uh, I, it's, for some reason, it's not muting. I feel like her thing is just... Mickey, mute or hang up. <laughs> I mean, I could kick her out, but I don't want to do that. No, 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 I want her here. Sorry, Uma. I just really couldn't Okay, help. there we go. She muted. Sure. Go ahead. So, so what I was saying was the, the history of, of, in film, of Black men being presented as a threat to white women, and the biggest evidence that we didn't get to mention in the class is in Get Out, you know, we literally see a black man kill an entire white family and we are cheering for him. You know, in the end he chokes this white girl to death and we're cheering for him. And I think that's like a really, like that's just monumental. I think that is a, a, a an excellent point. Yes, I think Get Out is actually, I was going to say maybe the next step is seeing a black man do uh, and commit an act of violence against a white woman, but we do not ascribe it to race. It becomes a character thing, you know, uh, and some, but Get Out is, the fact that we're cheering for him is even more monumental in some ways. So that is, that's a hell of a point. Yeah, and a black director, which is even, even better, even sweeter. Um, yes, Dave, go ahead. So I, I'll say something quick uh, without taking much of your time. Um, this is the ans partial answer to my own question that the flame doesn't die down the, after the news cycle is over, um, that there should be a true long solution to the racism. And as I felt in the beginning, I said that, you know, the power and authority is what um, makes racism, racism happen. Uh, what I feel um, and I want to share a number. I'll, I'll put, write it down in the chat also. Uh, this is a number to the Capitol Hill. Um, uh, and the way we can really, at least on one end, happen is the authorities with the legislators, the Senate and the congressmen. When some issue is there, you call your congressman, your senator, call them in the middle of the night because that's when you get their voicemails and you can leave a detailed message. I have actually done this and I'm going to share you a very dirty secret, but so be it. When the, um, this whole um, what is it, impeachment thing was going on for Trump, I am not, I'm independent voter, by the way. I am not from either side. Um, but I used to call the four swing senators, hopefully they will impeach him, um, and leave the voicemail on their uh, middle of the night on their, <laughs> on their thing saying I'm a, from their constitution. Uh, I, I and my whole family votes for them, but if they do not impeach him, I will not be supporting them henceforth. I live in California. I don't live in Alaska or Wayne, uh, wherever they are from, those four swing uh, Republican senators. But I tried. If we all call, them and leave voicemails in the middle of the night someday something will happen because they will be scared that they're going to lose their seat their power their authority and they will support the righteous thing to do that's my humble partial answer to my own question and i'll write the number down in chat yeah, do. the thing about i mean this, that's interesting right this idea that I think the thing that we have to do in order to keep the thing going is to really continue to hold legislators to the fire. This is me getting a little political, but like, for example, Amy Klobuchar, she was the one that actually forgave the cop that choked and killed George Floyd out the first time. For me personally, that's reason enough that she should not be in the running for vice president, no matter how she tries to make up for it now. It should be, I think, on a punitive level, where you mess up on this issue, it's too important. Sorry. It's just too important. This is the one you can't mess up on. And if you did, we're going to hold it against you. And uh, sorry if there are any Amy Klobuchar supporters in here, but it's like, I would like to believe that no matter what candidate I supported, 
if they had actually been lenient on the cop that did this, I'd be throwing them under the bus too, because there are certain things that are simply too important is what I think. And I think we need to make that point. We can't just go like, well, from now on, we can't have any more well from now on. It's, it's gotta be regressive as well. Anyway, that's me. Uh, <laughs> any other uh, any other thoughts? We've had some people who've been very silent. Nihar, I would like to hear from you. You know, because it's great that a 16-year-old is here and listening to this and talking about this. So what are you thinking? What's going on in that? I'm really trying to, like, build my opinions on this because, like, I try to like stay off of social media and things as much as possible to an extent because so much of like how much teenagers and like their opinions and things are influenced by it now. So like I, I don't like see a lot of people actually like critically thinking about it anymore and there's not a lot of reasons for why people think what they think suddenly. So I really just came here to kind of get a grasp on everything. Um, but I, yeah, of course, I think like we need to be uh, really progressive about this. And I think a lot of teenagers will, of course, say the same thing. I haven't heard a lot of people saying we shouldn't change. Um, is there like a specific question you had in mind? I just wanted to know, you know, what you were thinking as you did all of this, because to me, the generational change is where it's most interesting. You know, uh, I always think back to the fact that I was homophobic in high school simply because everyone around me was. Not saying in any way of like that I did anything, but it's like I heard people making fun of gay guys and I didn't say anything because that was the generation. And then two years later, it felt like everything changed. I was super ashamed. I was like, what the hell was I thinking? You know, it's, um, I just didn't think about it until it was almost later. And it changed so suddenly. Like I was so proud of, the people two, three years after me, the gay straight alliances, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, God, I was kind of a prick 30 years ago, you know? And it's, uh, I, I, that's the only thing that gives me hope in times like this. I look at the past and all I get is heartbreak. I look at the future and the younger kids and then I'm like, oh, maybe we got a show. Mm -hmm. um, like out of this, what I, one of the biggest things I noticed was like the lack of thinking about right and wrong while making these actions. Like um, they, they weren't exactly thinking about, is this the right thing to do? They rather thought about, will this change, cause change and cause progress in film? And I think that's what's happening now too. Like a lot of, um, I don't want to say like older people, but like more conservative maybe, um, they're like, they're really focusing in on is this right or is this wrong like what people are doing right now is wrong and therefore we shouldn't do it which like yeah of course this makes it like some sense it's reasonable but at the same time what like younger people are now trying to do is just cause that change in whatever way they can because there hasn't been as much change till now and I think a little bit of the problem is like like looking at this, how broad everything is, it's gonna take baby steps, right? Someone said that. Um, so it's not like even out of this, it might just be a wave. Like um, someone said, it like everything before this, it might just be a little push in the right direction. And I think that will anger a lot of people um, because people are gonna want instant results, um, especially at a time like this where they're all cooped up and want in, like things to happen for them they're gonna want instant results and they probably won't get them so that i think that's a good thing because this will keep people um like keep people focused on this for a longer amount of time and hopefully make this like if not not a wave at least it'll be like a really big wave so <laughs> that would i think it would be a good thing on the whole and also um uma said about film that she would like to see stories of like black people and just like not focusing on race necessarily, not focusing on society or issues, just like stories. And a lot of the time, like A24, I really love their films. And I feel like they do that a lot where they make stories which are just like about the human condition. And I, I um, JD said like people might not want to see that. And I, I think that's true, but like that's true for everything, you know, not everyone's gonna want to see every movie. So there's got to be some change somewhere and slowly it'll spread out to everywhere else. And I think seeing those movies would be a good step. Thank you, Niar. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. I got I to gotta back me up. <laughs> What's that? I got to back me up because that's not what I meant. 
when oh, I said okay, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. When I said sell, I meant like hundred, two hundred million dollar budget movies. Mm-hmm. You know, because we can make the small like talking head film, but like, what is that big idea that is just that story? You know. Yeah, what I mean? and, and that's actually been shown that I mean, Denzel Washington and Will Smith; these aren't the first names to do many of the things that they're doing. They're just the biggest names to do it. And Will Smith has said frequently, if it doesn't change in a blockbuster, it hasn't really changed. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and that's kind of interesting. I want to read, because Vicky put her thought in the chat, so this is no longer me talking, this is Vicky. I remember the first time learning about black slavery in second grade being about Rosa Parks not getting off the bus. I was the only one remotely sad about how fucked up she was treated. The more racist things the teacher taught about that time period, the more kids would instantly start using it against the black kids in that class. The teacher did not correct them like it was a racist thing. Rather, they hushed them as if they had interrupted class any other time. Somehow, I was the only one asking questions out of disbelief that someone could be judged purely for the color of their skin, and the teacher almost proudly would answer, yep, with a smile on it. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I do, that's another thing that I, that's what I'd like to end this conversation on, is uh, Uma said this earlier that, for example, in like film history classes, a lot of this stuff wasn't really brought up. We hear about Al Jolson being the first sound line, you know, you ain't heard nothing yet, but we don't hear all of the connotations, the blackface and everything that comes with that. And why a Jewish man was in a movie called The Jazz Singer trying to promote black culture and black music. Our history is so, is so sad. The fact that Christopher Columbus still is in, Christ- in history books as the guy who discovered America when that's absolutely patently untrue, right? And everyone knows that. And yet we, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue as if we have to hold on to these white role models who have been disproved. You know, and I really think one of the biggest solutions in this, in this conversation, is that adjustment of history. I kind of hate that I did an African-American film history class. I would prefer if it was a film history class where this was organically a part of it, that it didn't need a separate lens in order to do it, because it's all so intertwined and it's all part of the larger film history. So what I would recommend is the burning of so many existing history books and rewriting ones that actually make sense and are true, and are more true, because most of what our kids learn is bullshit. I know, because most of what I learned was bullshit. Uma, go ahead, you got a thought? Everyone class. (laughs) Yeah, I think that it's crazy how in film school we learn about the history of film as just the history of film technology and like form, history of film form, you know? How did this movie make it so that people use this technique? And how did this movie make it so that people told stories in this way? Here's how the close-up was invented, all that. But, but that's not what film is to anyone other than a filmmaker. You know, film is the number one most powerful medium in the world. And, and it changes people's minds and it changes cultures. And it's like, and that's how film history should be taught, is how did, this, how did these movies change the world? and how the world works. And it's just crazy to me that it's not taught like that. You know, and that's like a separate kind of elective class, like social film history. Like what? No, that is primary history. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is, uh, yeah, I mean, Millie's putting a great point in uh the chat as well where she says i feel if we are we are manipulated to feel empathy for a bigger wicked event agenda and i think that's absolutely true i think we are forced to see issues of importance from the side of the oppressor there are so many stories about like this dude was a terrible husband but this is why he had a bad childhood this person was like this here's george wallace who was terrible to black people his whole life but he ended up in a in a wheelchair and he said sorry once you know um these are the stories that were told and okay like here's what i want to see here's my next big thing i want to see a movie where thomas jefferson is revealed as a rapist 
all right? And where he's not celebrated for writing the Declaration of Independence, but as a guy who forced his slave to have sex with him. Okay, and that is, for me, the next thing. I want to see American idols who are guilty of these things held to the standards that they should be held to. Did Thomas Jefferson write the Declaration of Independence? Yes. Was he also patently against the independence of other people? Yes. And it shouldn't be a, here's Thomas Jefferson in full context. It should be a, no, what he did to Sally Hemings was not forbidden love, it was rape. She was his slave. She had no choice, right? And it's like, I wanna see these great American ideals torn down when they are wrong on this issue. Without that, it's not the apology that matters. It's, it's fo the follow through. It's like, do I need to celebrate Thomas Jefferson because he fought for you? Or can you understand that he didn't speak for all of us? That when he wrote the lines, all men are created equal, he didn't really mean it. You know, and it's like, and if you can accept that, and if you could say Thomas Jefferson isn't worth my history, if you can meet me on that level, then maybe we can have a conversation. You know, and that's how I feel. It's like, we just hold too true to some of these things. We hold true and, you know, sorry, to the Star Spangled Banner, which, which is original verse talked about slavery and the death of slaves. That's the song we're told to hold our heart to and like stand up and sing. And it's like, yeah, the, the rod is in the symbols, right? And those symbols kind of have to come down, I think before we can have change. Um, Lucia. Just, I'm wondering who's willing to share exactly that, the movie that they would want to see. Um, okay, I put in the chat, I put in the chat a musical that's a black character that's not a, like, that's just a musical. A musical with a black lead, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, which was Carmen Jones, by the way, with Dan, uh, Dorothy Dandridge, it was an opera, but a musical. Uh, Gabe, you had a thought and then we'll, but Whoever else is, if there's anyone else that's willing to share that has an idea, I would love to hear. If you have ideas for movies you would like to see that move the needle forward, either type it in the chat or share it now. Gabe, did you have an idea? I think the movie's already been made, but my dad was in, it's still a fun fact, my dad was in the Brown Berets in the 1970s, and he went to Garfield High School in East LA, and they like staged walkouts and stuff. Um, and like. Um, demand to demand like um pro like the right things you put in the textbooks that they were learning because they had no like like stuff about hispanic culture and like the stuff that was in there wasn't true and they made them and paint them in a bad light and it was like the majority of the school was hispanic and they just didn't they, they talking didn't about the edward james almost movie walkout yeah 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 my dad was one of those kids and he was in like the Rodney King protest and all that stuff in LA. Anyone else? Uh, Nihar. Uh, I think the good thing right now is that like we have so much access to information where before like a lot of information was just kind of put aside for people not to see. Um, and so now that we have that, I feel like one of the bigger problems is not turning all of these things into either or because they're all so much like more complex and nuanced than that. And like, they all kind of, they're all fitting in in a gray area. Like there are very few situations you can really reduce to an either or statement. And so I think people need to see that and approach more things in that way and being open to having those conversations in that way. Sure. All right, um, we are 10 minutes over. So I have to close up this conversation. Um, but thank you all so much for being a part of this safe environment where, you know, everyone feels like they could talk. I am so proud of the Hive and the community of the Hive, which, you know, when I started the Hive, I, I'll take a lot of credit for a lot of things at the Hive, but the community is all them. And I'm so happy with this diverse community. And it means so much to me that even during quarantine, we have this place where we can speak honestly and not have, you know, and actually have real conversations about this. And those of you that are visiting and joining us, thank you so much for spending your Thursday nights with us. Uh, thank you all. And that, uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Where can we session. see this? Where can we see this later?